Okay, welcome everybody to the Mises Institute. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Thornton. I'm a senior fellow here at the Mises Institute. And on behalf of Lou Rockwell and the entire uh, staff and faculty of the Institute, I'd like to welcome you here today for a seminar. And I'd like to, uh, of course, welcome all of our viewers uh, who are watching us on Mises.org. Our seminar this week is The Life and Times and Work of Ludwig von Mises. The seminar this week is sponsored by George and Joelle Eddy. And of course, we want to thank uh, them for helping to sponsor this important conference. All of our sessions here this week are going to begin at 10 a.m. in the morning and 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Central Time, uh, of course, Monday through Friday. Our speaker is Guido Holzman this week. And Dr. Holzman is a professor of economics at the University of Angers in France. Uh, Guido is the article uh, is the author of many books, uh, many articles that uh, appear in journals, and of course on Mises.org. Uh, Dr. Holzman is a senior fellow with the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Uh, he was a senior fellow in residence here at the institute for several years while working on the forthcoming intellectual biography of Ludwig von Mises, The Last Night of Liber Liberalism. And we're particularly uh, happy and uh, thrilled to have him here today uh, to talk about the life and times and work of Ludwig von Mises. Um, his uh, forthcoming bi intellectual biography of Mises uh, we're particularly excited about because it explores uh, the early years of Ludwig von Mises, the time before he came to the United States, the time when um, all of his great works were uh, written, all of his formative years when he was putting his uh, intellectual uh, landscape uh, together, uh, and it's the time when we really don't know that much about von Mises. So with uh, no further ado, help me please welcome Guido Holzman. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Lou. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe and Joel, uh, Eddie. Uh, who uh, George and Joel Eddy, who cannot be with us uh, today. I hope that maybe they I might be watching now. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you're supporting my work and that you're supporting the seminar. And I hope to meet you very soon again at another occasion. We have uh, so a, a seminar of 10 lectures this week, and it follows roughly uh, the outline of the book. Uh, in the Mises biography, uh, there are uh, chapters intertwined, chapters uh, dealing with uh, Mises ideas, uh, the ideas of uh, his colleagues and, and friends uh, who were important for him, intertwined with accounts of his life how, and, the, and the times in which he wrote. That is, political events, uh, personal uh, ha happenings, and so on. And uh, the idea is, of course, as in any uh, biography, to explain why he did certain things uh, as a reaction uh, against what was happening in the larger context in which he inserted himself. Uh, and as Marx said, well, uh, about 60% uh, um, uh, of the book, or 70% of the book, deals with Mises before he uh, came to the United States. That is Mises up until 1940, approximately. Um, and I did this not only because uh, it, uh, it is most interesting, certainly for American readers and also for European readers, because there is no full biography of Ludwig von Mises in print so far, but also because, well, it, it corresponds to uh, life achievement. Mostly people are not very much, uh, very uh, productive anymore once they're older than 70 years. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, and there's George Crispin. Uh, who is here among us, and there is uh, uh, Bert Blumert. Uh, there's Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, who started becoming really productive uh, only uh, at the age of 56, when he had his awakening from the dogmatic slumber, as he called it. And then he churned out one volume after the other in, in a space of, of 16 or 18 years. Uh, it was not the case with Mises. Mises was also very productive later in his life, so he published... Uh, uh, five or six books after he came to, or, well, actually eight books after he came to the United States. Um, but uh, still, the bulk of his achievement, achievements dated from an earlier period, and so it was only natural that this uh, came to be expressed also in the biography. The biography is, and I regret, uh, regret in a way to say this, it, it is a very large book. So it's more than a thousand pages. And for those of you who do not like to read, 
you've done very well to come to the seminar, <laughs> or maybe to watch now, uh, because, well, uh, you will get uh, to know a lot of this stuff already, well, uh, much of this stuff, um, by just following the, the lectures. But, uh, I mean, there are many other reasons, of course, to buy this, uh, the biography, even if you do not like reading. I mean, maybe you have friends who like to read. <laughs> I, your parents might like reading. I mean, they might have this old-fashioned habitude. Or, um, because it's very thick, I mean, there are various other uses, right? If you have a bulky door, you put this there, or you have a restless night, you put it under your pillow. There are good reasons to buy this book. And it has a, it has a wonderful cover, uh, namely this, this one here, uh, the, the Lifetimes and Work of, of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, actually, the title will be Mises, The Last Night of, of, of Liberalism. Some people were a little bit concerned about the title. It might be too much uh, backward-looking, and to some extent, I, sh I shared this concern. Right? If we, we present Mises as the last night of liberalism, isn't this something that pertains exclusively to the past? Uh, and doesn't Mises uh, represent ideas that are important for our times and hopefully even more important for the future? Yes, uh, in a way. Uh, but uh, Mises marks, uh, uh, well, uh, a tide of times, right? He he's, he's, he was uh, the last in a great line of, of classical liberals. And uh, he inspired works that went in many ways uh, beyond his own, um, uh, his own achievements most notably in the case of Mary Rothbard uh, and of people associated today with the Mises Institute, about whom we will talk at the end of the week. So Mises, is a, as a person, is a historical juncture. Uh, he's the last in a, in a great line, but he's also an opening uh, to the future. In, in this respect, certainly the title is justified. So what we'll do uh, this morning is uh, just to cover the... Uh, Four, uh, first four chapters, and the first four chapters are rather um, uh, bulky and will not be able to cover all the ground, but I'll give a brief overview of uh, Mises' roots, this is uh, family uh, and upbringing, um, the, uh, the role uh, of the family in, in their country, in a particular region of Austria-Hungary, which is uh, named Galicia, the, fam uh, the family business and, and the family life once they move to, to Vienna, where Mises would then spend most of his life. Uh, and then we'll talk about his upbringing further in Vienna, the school years, uh, about Vienna in general, what were the social and economic, the political uh, problems that moved people in those days and that formed the background of his later achievements. And uh, we'll eventually uh, uh, talk, hopefully, about his university, yes. He received his initial academic formation. Okay, so we have um, uh, Mises' uh, family. So Mises was born in a country that no longer exists today, which is called Austria-Hungary. This is a map of Austria-Hungary. Unfortunately, I, don't, I, have, I didn't bring a map of... Um, Europe, which would have allowed you to further locate this. So you see this is Switzerland here, and this here is Italy. And part of Italy, namely these parts here, belonged to Austria-Hungary until the uh, late 1850s. There were other parts of Europe that also belonged to Austria-Hungary before uh, the time of the map. The map dates from about uh, the turn of the century, about 1900. Uh, so it was not always the case that all uh, national territories were contiguous, sometimes there were islands uh, within other, other countries and so on. So, for example, one important territory that uh, for a time belonged to Austria-Hungary was Belgium, or what is today Belgium, um, as well as uh, the, this area which is in southwest Germany, this here, the Schwarzwald, the Black, Black Forest area. Uh, so all of this belonged to, to Austria-Hungary, and actually one of the most famous areas uh, namely the one around uh, Salzburg, oh, uh, Salzburg is here, came and we always, well, when we say Salzburg, we think of Mozart, right, the, the famous composer, and you think, well, that's as Austrian as it gets, but actually <laughs> the Salzburg area came to Austria much later than these other territories, right, so the Italian dominions have been part of Austria-Hungary longer than Salzburg. Okay, so we have this uh, landmass here, and it is a quite substantial landmass. Actually, it was the second largest political 
entity in Europe, second only to Russia. Uh, so larger than Germany, of course, larger uh, than France, larger, larger than Sweden, larger than Spain, and so on. Very big thing. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it was powerful, and, uh, which is a different uh, subject, but which we'll come to talk later on too. And what you see on, on this map then also are, well, so differently uh, colored areas. What is here in yellow is uh, Hungary and the de dependent uh, territories. Um, and the other things that are shaded in orange are, uh, well, what we might call Austria, to make things uh, briefly, but which were uh, called at the time those dominions and lands and kingdoms uh, which were united, which were represented in the Reichsrat, that is, in the, in the parliament of the non-Hungarian part of the empire. Okay? It's a very complicated uh, setting. It's not as straightforward as we have it today in various countries, such as the United States. Right? We have two senators and whatever, a couple of representatives per, per state. There are only 52 states, and everything is clear and neat and hierarchical. And here we have uh, lots of uh, uh, things that are, that, are, that are intertwined. And this uh, structure, in fact, this, this neat division between the Austrian part and the Hungarian part was a result of um, uh, Austria's defeat, or the, the defeat of the ruling house of Austria, uh, Hungary, which was the house of Habsburg, uh, its defeat at uh, 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 a war that it led against its former German allies, particularly against Prussia, uh, in 1867. It was the famous battle at Königgratz, and uh, the Austrian, uh, the Austrian lost, and as a consequence. They were no longer, uh, the House of Habsburg was no longer the leading um, political force within the Germanies, but it also had big problems inside the country. Once you lose a war, it's very expensive. Well, leading a war, as we know, now in the United States is a very expensive affair. And in the best of all cases, in the best of all cases, you win very quickly and you make a lot of loot, which would allow you to pay uh, for your former expenses, but also pay for your allies and so on, uh, create, uh, create greater loyalty and so on. Now here it was the opposite. They lost the war and they had no more money to create loyalties within the country, right? To uh, rally uh, the, the different people with different political orientations to the crown. And as a consequence, there were strong separatist movements. And the crown was therefore forced to strike a deal with the most powerful, the most reluctant princes, uh, uh, which happened to be in Hungary. Hungary. Uh, and so they uh, set up a constitutional deal that was called the Ausgleich, or the, well, the Compromise, right? the Compromise of 1867. According to this Ausgleich, uh, the Reich was, uh, in fact, ruled by two separate parliaments. One was the Hungarian parliament, and the other one was the Austrian uh, parliament, or as I said, the, the Reichsrat. So two different um, parliaments. And there was a common connection only through the ruling house. Right? So the reason why we can paint here a common border for this whole colorful thing was that there was one common emperor, the house of, of Habsburg. And the, uh, the Hungarians did not acknowledge, the, by the way, the emperor as the emperor as, the, as, uh, as, as their chief, because he was the German emperor, but because he coincidentally happened to be the king of Hungary. Okay, and uh, because they had this particular interpretation of uh, constitutional realities, they tried to get an ever better deal from him. That is, try to ask him for ever more concessions uh, in the following years, which was the reason why. Uh, the, um, there was a political dynamic within Austria-Hungary that finally led to the explosion of the whole entity. But I'll talk about this a little bit more later on. Now, within Austria-Hungary, we see here in the northeasternmost uh, part, we see uh, a province that is called Königreich Galicien und Lodomerien, Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria. I want tell you anything about the name, uh, go into detail about the name, but we'll call this Galicia. That's how it was, uh, well, commonly called, was commonly co referred to uh, today. And you see here, here, the city of Lemberg, 
which was the capital city of that part of, uh, of the empire. Now, um, uh, Mises was born in Lemberg. His family came from this uh, Galicia area. And so we need to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the particularities of, of, of this area and its relationship with the capital of the, um, of the empire, which was here in Vienna, Wien. Okay. Um, one thing that is important to know about these differences was that okay, this uh, huge conglomerate was not only, did not only make for a colorful map, but in fact represented very diverse parts of population. In the western part, you have typically uh, a German population, almost uh, exclusively German uh, inhabitants. In this part here, Bohemia, you had uh, Czechs and Germans. Here we had Moravia, you had uh, Moravians, and also a couple of Germans. Uh, Hungary, uh, essentially Hungarians, uh, and uh, various other uh, minority. In the south, we had Italians. This part here was inhabited by Italians. And uh, in this part, in Galicia, we had uh, a mixture of um, uh, Poles, Germans, uh, and Jews, essentially. These were the uh, three major groups, and uh, sorry, and, and Russians. Poles, Germans, Russians, and Jews, and, well, again, various minorities, Italians, and so on. Now, from a religious point of view, too, right, we have uh, lots of different groups here. We have, okay, we have Catholics, we have Orthodox, we have Roman Catholics, Greek Catholics, we have uh, Jews, we have Protestants, and I hope I didn't exclude now, I'll forget any major other groups, but these were the major groups, and they were all represented also in this area, okay? So the population of uh, uh, Galicia at the turn of the century was roughly uh, 5 million people, right? and to give you an order of magnitude, we have, uh, we're talking about here 2.2 uh, Roman Catholics, most of, that, of which were Poles, but also substantial German numbers, uh, and 2.2 million um, Greek Catholics. These were Russians uh, of a particular breed that is almost forgotten today. Uh, they, they were called Ruthenians. And we have one famous writer associated with, uh, well, who's well, often writing for LouRockwell.com, who is Joe Sobren. Some of you might know him, and Joe Sobran acknowledges the Ruthenian heritage. So he says, Ruthenian, very strange thing. So what you need to know is, okay, it's, it's Russian, right? but Russians who repented themselves to the Pope, uh, well, so we have a Greek cult and are uh, Catholics. And then we have uh, Jews, 300,000 Jews approximately, but the Jews are largely concentrated in the major cities. Uh, we have, in uh, the city of Lemberg, we have around uh, 60,000 60, inhabitants, 30,000 uh, Roman and Greek Catholics, and uh, 25,000 Jews. Okay, so as uh, the Jews were within the, the larger empire, or within the, the larger province, they were just a minority of whatever. Uh, so 300,000, let me say, 6%, okay, 6%. In the capital city of Lemberg, they represented almost 50 percent, well, second, well, probably the largest homo homogeneous group within the capital city. And then there were other cities that were virtually exclusively Jewish, uh, for example, Brody at, at the frontier here. Um, you, you cannot read this. This is a small town here. No, it's, it's not Lisable. In any case, here, this, uh, this is the place where it is. Brody, and I insist, because uh, that's the place where uh, part of the Mises family came from, in particular um, uh, several grandmothers of Ludwig von Mises, uh, and also the family of his, um, of his mother, uh, of, his, uh, of Adele von Mises, about whom we will talk later on too. Brody is, was an interesting case in that this was a free trade area between um, uh, Austria-Hungary and Russia. So, very nice thing. And you could uh, make decent business, at least there. And so some, some families make good use of this. And it was, happened to be, uh, one of these families happened to be the Landau family, uh, which was the family of Ludwig von Mises' mother. 
Okay, now we talked already a lot about uh, these uh, maps. And I'll show you just maybe one or two more photos. So this is how G Lemberg looks like. This is a square in Lemberg. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Nope. This is another, well, it doesn't come out very well. One last picture from Lemberg. And so, I mean, uh, what, what is striking here for those of you who haven't been uh, yet been to this area of the world, uh, the architecture is uh, essentially the same, and the architectural setting of the city is, is the same as in all other parts of uh, uh, Austria-Hungary. So, uh, the, the, since the probability is not very big that you might go to, to Lemberg, but some of you might go actually to, to Prague and visit the wonderful uh, Czech capital, which is here, right? And if you go to Vienna, which is here, uh, and other places that are further west and so on, what you'll see is essentially an architecture that is the same as the one that you see on this picture here. Okay. So it was a cultural unity despite all the diversity in, uh, in religion and in national affiliation and so on that came to be expressed in things like architecture. And here then we have the birth of young Ludwig. Da, 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 da. Okay, so this must be in, in his Lemberg years, the formative Lemberg years. Uh, and he was born in uh, September, uh, September 29, 1881, to these parents, uh, very stately, uh, Arthur and Adele von Mises, so both coming from, from uh, Jewish families, um, uh, Arthur was a railway engineer. We'll talk about this again later. And uh, Adele didn't have a profession, so as she would, we would say today, she, she was a homemaker. Okay, and she took uh, these duties very seriously. It was, uh, as we see from, from the dress and so on, was a, a bourgeois family. It was not extremely wealthy, but it was well anything between at ease and and affluent. Okay, and so they, uh, to give you an uh, order of ideas, so they, of course they would have. Um, uh, personnel at home, right? They would have a cook, uh, would have a housemaid, and so on. And so, really, uh, her task was to bring up the boys. Okay. And well, if we just uh, uh, take Lu Ludwig von Mises as, as the prime example, she must have done obviously a, a very good job, right? <laughs> it was not an accident because uh, the surviving brother of um, of Ludwig, uh, Richard, was also uh, a first class. Uh, scientist, became a mathematician, engineer, and so on. He was even at his uh, lifetime was more famous than Mises, and he's at, uh, among uh, mathematicians interested in the history of thought. He's still as famous today as, uh, as Ludwig von Mises is among economists. So this is not an accident, this is systematic. Okay, if you have two out of two, <laughs> it's a pretty good rate, right? And that, that was her job. Uh, so they married. Um, they married in which year? 1880. Uh, I think, well, I might have forgotten that. 1880. Yeah, it was 1880. One year later, exactly, Ludwig was, was born. And they lived at the time in Lemberg, which was the traditional uh, place where his family lived. She came from this uh, family that, with roots in the small town of, of Brody that I mentioned before at, at the border. And her family was now already moving toward the capital city, city of, of Vienna, which was not yet the case with this man, but he would, they would move pretty, pretty quickly. And of course, one thing also deserves to be mentioned, namely that Ludwig was born a noble man. This is uh, the family crest, which you know from, from the Mises Institute, so the Mises Institute is putting this to good use now. Uh, and the uh, ennoblement of the family took place in the year of uh, Ludwig's birth. Okay, so uh, before uh, Mises' father was just Arthur Mises and his grandfather 
uh, Hirsche Mises and then his grand-grandfather Maya Rachmiel Mises. And it was actually Maya Rachmiel, who was a great personality about whom we'll, we'll talk uh, in a moment, uh, who was honored uh, and rewarded by the emperor for his uh, services with the title of nobility. So in April 1881, Maya Rachmiel uh, was awarded the title uh, of, of nobility, was then Maya Rachmiel von Mises. And a couple of months later, September 1881, he uh, uh, obtains, in addition to this, the noble predicate, that's how they call it, a noble predicate, Edler. Okay. And therefore, Mises then was born uh, punctually after all this being done, September 29, as Ludwig Heinrich Edler von Mises. Okay. And all what's left today for us is Ludwig von Mises, which is good enough, right? Because I've almost become Arabic. Now, uh, I won't go into detail with the family quest. Maybe two things that we have mentioned is this year is the, uh, the symbol of uh, the uh, Greek uh, god of, of Mercury is a symbol of, of commerce. And in the upper left corner, we have the Bible, the Ten Commandments. Okay, so we have a family with roots in both uh, uh, religion and, uh, and commerce. Now, uh, to talk about the, the Mises family, uh, to understand the, the well the significance of, of the family into which Mises was born, um, uh, we need to underline uh, two aspects. Well, one of course is business, and about business I'll, I'll talk a little bit later. The other one is uh, the, the cultural mission, right? So we have uh, business and and religion, and we'll first talk about religion, <laughs> then come to to business. Uh, and religion, now, from a larger point of view, uh, culture. So again, uh, right, uh, Mises' family was a Jewish family, which was a minority within the native Galicia, uh, surrounded by a large Polish majority. Why this? Where, where did all these Poles come from? Uh, you can also ask, why, where did all the Jews come from? Okay. <laughs> and well, that, that's another big story, but I won't talk about this. In detail now, uh, but you see here that the front, there's no Poland here, right? That's a very interesting thing. Here's Germany, here's Russia, here's Romania, and there's Austria Hungary. No Poland. Uh, now we have two, two Poles here, at least two Poles. Uh, and in and those days, was uh, black days for Poles, and they said, uh, Poland is not yet lost, right? That was their main, um, encouragement. So Poland is not yet lost, and uh, Poland indeed had disappeared and vanished from the map uh, in uh, uh, a series of partitions starting in, in 1772. Poland had become politically weak. Uh, so and as we know from today, uh, this whets uh, the appetite of uh, competing governments in those days. Well, for economic reasons, governments did not yet conquer territories 5,000 miles away, but they occupied territories that were adjacent. And so we had uh, very hungry governments here in Germany. We had the, uh, we had the, the, the Prussian king, which was uh, up here. Then we had the Russian Tsar. And we had the emperor down here in Austria-Hungary. And they, well, they divided Poland amongst them uh, in, in, uh, in two, in, essentially in two partitions in the uh, 70s. Uh, and as a consequence then, so this area fell to Austria, uh, uh, to Austria at the time, uh, as it was called, the, the Habsburg uh, Empire. And uh, uh, it was essentially inhabited by Poles, and there were Jews, because many Jews, again for historical reasons that I won't explain now in detail, uh, lived in Poland in those years. So we had this Polish uh, majority, and life is not always nice under a ruling class. Uh, so therefore, Jews in particular, or many Jews in particular, well, sought for uh, emancipation, longed for emancipation. And emancipation came with the new rulers. So there was a chance now to uh, join the camps of, of the winner uh, of the war, the, the German 
uh, occupants or the new German rulers uh, and thereby to gain uh, greater liberties at the expense of the former ruling class, namely the Polish nobility. And that's what uh, parts of the Jews did, not all uh, Jewish did, but parts did, and we are interested in those parts because the Mises family was part of it. Okay, The Mises family was one of the ma major uh, Jewish families in Galicia of those years who spearheaded the Germanization movement in Galicia for the century to come. Okay, And this lasted from uh, the partition of Poland in the late 18th century until 1867. Okay, the famous Battle of Königgrath that I mentioned before, which propelled separatist movements within Austria-Hungary, created the necessary constitutional adjustments within, uh, in the form of the Ausgleich or the con constitutional compromise uh, to appease the, the most powerful princes who were likely to uh, secede. And it had a very similar impact in the case of uh, the Galician nobility, which was Polish. So the Galician Polish nobility obtained also a special constitutional deal in the same year, 1867, uh, and which rolled back almost one century of uh, efforts to Germanize the country. Okay, bring in German settlers, have German as, as the administrative language, uh, as the language of business, and so on. All right. So all this was rolled back after 1867, and then it had virtually died out by the 1880s and 1890s. Now, the Mises family spearheaded this movement, and uh, one way they did it was to bring uh, German language and German uh, uh, culture to their um, uh, synagogue. Right? So they, they wanted to create a progressive synagogue, was not only the Mises family, but one of the major families, uh, that sought to establish a progressive synagogue in Lemberg where services would be held in German, okay, uh, and um, uh, which had a greater, uh, was, was uh, much more open towards secular culture um, uh, around the, the, the religious culture. Now the... Um, uh, uh, so, so Mises then was, uh, the, the, the Mises family then had, from the outset, they had roots in Poland, and right? also political roots, uh, uh, that, uh, roots in political culture that were uh, important uh, for Mises. Um, one particularity of political culture uh, in Poland that those of you who have read the suggested reading for this first, uh, uh, for this first meeting, Kühnert Ledin's text on the cultural background of Ludwig von Mises, you have noticed that Kühnert Ledin uh, points out that uh, Poland had a rather particular uh, political constitution which made that uh, the king was uh, virtually powerless and all power rested with the nobility which met in a parliament called the Zaim, S-E-J-M, the Zaim. And the particularity of this parliament, a rather uh, charming uh, aspect from a libertarian point of view, was that you had a um, uh, liberum veto, that is, uh, veto power for each single individual. That is, no law could pass if there was one, even one man who was not in agreement with it. Okay, so you can imagine how many laws were passed, right? Now, I imagine people living or uh, working in Washington find this rather shocking, and I guess the same thing would be people living and working in Brussels or in Berlin or Paris and so on, but for most of us other people down here, uh, in the rest of the country is a very charming aspect. Right? So it's a very efficient way to minimize law, uh, laws or legislation. Another uh, um, proposition has recently been made by a friend of mine. He said, well, actually it would also limit it very much if they were forced to read all laws that they vote. Just read them out in Parliament. It's technically impossible to read out, at least not with a human voice and human understanding. I, uh, you'd have to go high, high, uh, high speed fast forward or something. But you cannot read all the laws that they pass. I'm impossible. So the Poles did not have this problem. Right? It was a very uh, decentralized, uh, uh, self-reliant political cu culture. But again, so this was just political, right? the political background and so on that impregnated certainly 
the political culture of the Mises family, but their main orientation was to bring uh, German culture, German secular culture in particular, because German culture was not associated with a particular religion. It was in those days, right, we are talking about the early 19th century, it's nothing to do with the 20th century, early 19th century, German culture was conceived to be the most progressive, the most liberal uh, uh, culture uh, in uh, continental Europe. Okay, then we have the business ties of the of the Mises uh, family. Uh, so traditionally, we are they are uh, merchants. Um, the first uh, ancestor of uh, Ludwig von Mises that I could identify is a man called. Uh, Ephraim Fischer von Mises, who lived uh, at the turn of the 18th and 19th century, uh, and who had an um, uh, export-import business uh, trading across the border with Russia. Okay, so that, that was his, his business, and he was uh, specialized in cloth in particular. He lived in Lemberg, which was a particularity because the cities, to the extent that there were not Jewish cities uh, from the outset, usually had only a limited residence uh, permission for uh, Jewish citizens. In fact, Jewish the Jews were often not considered to be citizens at, at all. So they were usually not allowed within the big uh, cities such as Lamberg and had uh, uh, residence right only uh, due to special uh, permission. And the permission was granted if the individual in question was affluent. Uh, if he um, uh, uh, had the necessary uh, education, and right, also secular institutions and so on, uh, state administration, and thirdly, especially if the person in question did not wear traditional Jewish garb, okay, no particular heads or uh, uh, trousers or whatever. Uh, so this obviously was the case of Ephraim, uh, official uh, von Mises, and uh, he gave birth to uh, the true founder of the Mises uh, family, the Mises dynasty, uh, which is the, the aforementioned um, Maya Ragnil von Mises, who was born in 1801 and who died in 1891. Now, we don't have any picture of Maya Ragnil, and uh, we, in fact, we have one a uh, portrait which is uh, left on a coin. I hope to be able to show you the coin later on this morning. I, I, I couldn't find it, but I think we have it here at the Mises Institute. Uh, I think Bettina, uh, Bettina Greaves uh, bequeathed it uh, to the Mises Institute. So he is represented on a, on a coin. And the coin was struck on the occasion of his noblement in 1881. So Maya uh, uh, quickly joined the family business of his father and then uh, at the age of 30, was already a major uh, uh, commercial player in Lemberg uh, and beyond. And he was uh, quickly also elected to the uh, uh, to the presidency of the synagogue, to all, what they call the cultural, um, the, the, the Israeli uh, culture, uh, cultural community in Lemberg. So he was the president of this starting from the 1840s. And he established, so he not only made a lot of money with his business, but he also established schools and orphanages and so on. So it was uh, various uh, uh, expenses of a caritative nature, which were also instrumental in uh, procuring him later on the ennoblement. Um, Maya Rachmiel later on then shifted the family business into the two most dynamic industries that existed in the second half of the 19th century, namely banking and railroads. Okay, and for those of you who know their economic history, you know that this went in hand at the time. Right? Banking was pulled by this new uh, major industry, which, which was railroads, uh, was also needed by railroads in order to finance these large-scale investment projects. So the Mises family, so Maya Rachmiel himself uh, became a banker, Right, abandoned his or well, neglected his uh, traditional merchant business, became a banker, and placed his sons into banks 
or into railroad companies. Uh, among his uh, sons, we have uh, in particular one son who was called Abraham, was the, the older son, and the younger son was called Hirsche, H-I-R-S-C-H-E, Hirsche Mises, and Hirsche was uh, Ludwig von Mises' grandfather. Okay, was the younger one, and not much is known about him. He worked, uh, he married into a banking family, as one way to get into the banking business. Uh, you look for a, uh, if possible, beautiful Harris, and then court her successfully. And, uh, well, it worked out in his case, so he married into the Nierenstein Bank. Uh, word near, the, the name Nierenstein might be familiar to some of you, for those of you who are interested in art. There's a f famous Nierenstein Gallery in, in New York, uh, uh, which was established there after World War II by one Nierenstein who came out of this family, went before a big gallery in Vienna and in Paris. Uh, and he was, in fact, a cousin of Ludwig von Mises. Okay, so Mises' grandfather married into the Mises in the into the Nierenstein family, and then became uh, an executive of the Nierenstein Bank in Lemberg. His sons were placed into railroad companies as engineers, and among them, in particular, Arthur von Mises, Ludwig von Mises' father. So Arthur was an engineer. Which made that so he was in the most dy dynamic industry of his time. Certainly had a very decent salary. Um, and uh, well, so the uh, and the re the essential reason why he later why he moved with his family to to Vienna at some point in the 1880s was because the railroads were nationalized. Okay, something that governments like to do. If an industry works very well and there are big profits to be made, and maybe there are also social conflicts, so which require the intermediation of a neutral arbiter. Uh, so a government in the 1880s started taking over the railroad industry in Austria-Hungary. And as a consequence, his company was nationalized and he became a civil servant. And then an employee of the railroad ministry in Vienna. So the family moved to Vienna. Okay. Uh, the railroad industry had already been uh, nationalized in the, in the 1840s. At, at that point, there was not yet any railroad industry in Galicia. That came later. And they were privatized again um, because uh, the government ran out of money after it had lost the war. So the railroads were privatized in the 1850s and then renationalized in the 1880s. Oh, here it is. Thank you very much. So here we have him then. Maya Rachmir, oh, 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 oh no, oh no, that's terrible, so what do we do here? Can you see this? Is there, is there a possibility for us to, to modify the light, maybe like this? Ah! Is this better? Yeah. Okay, so what you see here, this is, so this is a portrait of Maya Rachmir, and you see 1880. Uh, it's the date when the, the, the coin was made, commemorative coin. And here we have uh, the family crest. As, unfortunately, it's not very visible. Uh, okay, so, and of course, he, this is also the man behind these different marriages and so on, because in those days, love, uh, marriage was not a pure love affair. It still is not today, but okay, we forget this until we get married. Uh, so in those days, well, people were not allowed to forget this, even before marriage, so it was usually the parents who took care of them, or the, or the grandparents, and he certainly arranged uh, various marriages within the family, placed his sons and daughters for, to arrange for strategic family alliances uh, in Galicia. So the family moves to, to Vienna. The family moves to Vienna, and uh, uh, so here we have um, uh, two stations uh, that are important. One is, well, so Ludwig's upbringing, Ludwig's education in the gymnasium at, at the university. So what follows our talk essentially about this. And then if we have a little time, I'll talk a little bit uh, about the, the, the main social conflicts at the time. 
Vienna in general. Okay, so, so they moved to Vienna. Uh, the move to Vienna, to the capital city, was of course a, a big event uh, for the family and certainly something that they looked forward to, uh, especially Adele, Ludwig's mother, who was concerned about the upbringing of her sons. And so she had three sons, Ludwig, Richard, and Karl. Karl died at a very young age of scarlet fever. So we don't know anything, we don't know more about this, uh, more than this about Karl. We have uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, I can show you. I can show you family pictures with the three of them. So here we have mother, Richard, Ludwig, and Karl. Uh, so Carl was, uh, must have been a boy of uh, six or seven uh, when he died. Here we have another photo where he, where he is a little bit younger. So in traditional mountain garb. Right? And uh, it's uh, almost sure that they took this photo while uh, they were already in Vienna. Because it's not a traditional Galician garb. You see here is the traditional Alpen uh, garb that you have in the western part of the country. So, um, uh, little one Karl must have been there at this about three or four year, years of age, Ludwig maybe seven or eight, and Richard six or seven. Yep. So they move to Vienna and live in an apartment. Uh, it was unusual, it's still unusual at the time to, to, uh, to own uh, separate uh, houses there, so that, that was the thing to do. And of course, they had a big apartment, they brought their maid, they brought their cook, they could house everybody, it was fine. And uh, Vienna was, of course, um, uh, uh, w was the place to be for, uh, uh, if you wanted to get your children an education. Right? So the best schools in the country were there, not only the best schools, but uh, lots of other things from which uh, to, to, arrive, uh, to derive education. Uh, so you had all the cultural, cultural institutions, you had the theaters, uh, you had the, the opera house, you had the um, uh, concerts, uh, so you had uh, lots of music, you had uh, bookshops, book publishers, and so on. They, they were there. Um, you had uh, a concentration of all the major administrations of the country. Uh, all the major scientific institutions of the country, and of course, uh, the headquarters of all major business firms were there too. And all of this within the confines of a rather small area. So we'll look at this again. So here we have a map of, uh, of Vienna uh, from about 1850. What you see here was that, uh, so this is, uh, Vienna with the architectural structure of absolutism, right? Royal power and imperial power and so on. Uh, we have here an island of buildings surrounded by a big empty uh, surface, right? And then settlements around this. So here we had uh, the administrative center of the entire empire, and, uh, with the uh, imperial family was living there, and, and all the ministries and so on, uh, people working for them. And around this, you, you see this maybe, you have, we have here the ramparts. You see this line with these um, uh, triangle-shaped uh, things. So, so these are the ramparts. It was, it was uh, uh, defense um, uh, wall, uh, well, meant to pr protect the uh, the heart uh, uh, of the government in the case of invasions. And the reason why it's empty around is, well, because to better shoot the enemy. Okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you have a guerrilla warfare. So right here, when they approach, you can nicely shoot them. Also, have insurgents shoot them better there. And when there was nobody there to invade or to insert himself, then they used the space for military exercises and so on, right? Parades and, and so on. Now, so all this ended in the 1850s and 1860s, right? Uh, was the uh, one last effort at uh, the reinstallation of an absolutist uh, reign in the, in the 1850s, but this was very unsuccessful. And so the rampart was destroyed, and all of this was 
uh, and covered with buildings, in particular with a splendid boulevard, which has the shape of the former area around the ra uh, rampart, that is a U-shape, uh, on which were located then uh, buildings um, uh, created in the image of the, the values of the new uh, political elite within the country. And the political elite in those uh, decades were the liberals, or the cl classical liberals, we might say. Okay, And so we had then uh, uh, parliamentary buildings that were set up here, the upper house and the, and the, and the lower chamber. We had museums. Uh, still, we still have a splendid collection today, the Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Modern His History uh, in Vienna. We have the Opera House, which is down here, and a concert hall. And we have various schools, one of which was the school where Mises went to, the Akademisches Gymnasium, the academic gymnasium, cannot really translate this, which is located about here. Okay, so in this area. So this was the time when the Mises family um, uh, arrived there. Uh, this area is, well, as I said, is, is rather small. You can, you can walk easily through this within, uh, let's say, 30 minutes or so. No problem. If you compare this to other uh, major capital cities, let's say Paris or even Berlin or, or London especially, right, you need much more time. But it's so much bigger. It's also much older. Uh, so here you had a very small area in which everything was very strongly concentrated. So again, the major cultural, scientific, uh, administrative, business institutions, all of this brought together, and the Mises family moves right into there. They move to an apartment that is situated also in this newly built area about here, uh, Friedrichstraße. Um, Yeah, so Ludwig goes uh, uh, first as a couple of, you know, of mandatory elementary uh, education and then joins a gymnasium at the age of 11. Now, a gymnasium uh, today in Germany is about the same thing as a high school in the U.S. Uh, it's a fairly uh, good comparison. Uh, in those days, it was completely different. So if we, we cannot translate simply gymnasium by high school, because it would give us the wrong association. So first of all, one thing you need to know is that only about 5% of each age group went to such a school, okay, 5%, which means you have a very rough selection already in economic terms, because not all families could afford to send their, their children there, and then also in intellectual terms, right? because the schools were obviously interested in attracting the brightest kids, and often... Uh, intelligence education goes in hand with uh, uh, corresponding uh, family background, but not always, right? And so, for these cases, in these cases also, they try to attract uh, such pupils, uh, which they which they did. Um, and also, the subjects covered were uh, much more advanced, especially in the later years, and the uh, subjects that are typically dealt with in our high schools today. Uh, so, Mises. Uh, had, for example, throughout uh, uh, the uh, 10 or 12 years or so of his stay at the uh, Akademisches Gymnasium, he had uh, eight hours per week of Latin, okay? Every single year, eight hours per week. And then as from the third year, he had six hours of uh, Greek, okay? And so you imagine, well, so these were not the dumbest kids in the first place, and then... Uh, so what their level of, of Latin and, and Greek was when they came out. Right? And so effectively, in the, in the final exam, they had to translate from Latin and from Greek, and they had, even had to translate from German into Latin. Okay, So it's not, not bad at all. Uh, on this level already, and then, of course, they had mathematics, they had German. In, in the first uh, one or two years, they had calligraphy, uh, the art of beautiful writing. And uh, we see this uh, here again. We have here the, the, the signature of Ludwig von Mises, which you see on the, on the main uh, uh, screen. Uh, Ludwig Mises, that, that is actually his handwriting. Right? So we can still read it today. I'll later show you on copies of, of some of the letters I had to read. You cannot read them, <laughs> uh, which was part of the difficulty of the physical 
difficulties of, of writing this biography. But in case he had a, a beautiful handwriting, it was not only Mother Adela who was responsible for this, but also the school, right? So they, they systematically trained this. And then there are the other subject matters, like that, physics and uh, natural history in particular, and history. And Mises' uh, famous, uh, 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 sorry, Mises' favorite uh, subject matter was actually uh, history. Uh, history in school, and it was uh, the only subject matter in which he excelled as compared to his uh, classmates. Uh, he was one of the uh, best pupils in class, but he was not the very best. He was out of a group of about 30 kids, he was number six. Okay, so he was not the very top, but he was a good pupil, and he excelled only in history, so which foreshadows also his later interests. Maybe I should uh, simply quote him uh, you know, something he said later on uh, on the, the importance of studying history. Uh, in fact, in his final exam in German at the Akademisches Gymnasium when he, when he left school in 1900, uh, he had to write an essay on the on the question with the following title: What are the moral inspirations that we derive from the study of the history of Austria? Unfortunately, the, the essay is not left. Uh, there's no trace of this. Um, but uh, many years later, uh, later, he made a statement that gives maybe a hint as to what he might have written in May 1900. Maybe also it's completely different, right? Because after all, you know, the more mature view later on. So the quote that follows now is from Theory and History, published in 1957. Speaking of the benefits of studying history, Mises wrote, I quote, it opens the mind toward an understanding of human nature and destiny. It increases wisdom. It is the very essence of that much misinterpreted concept, a liberal education. It is the foremost approach to humanism, the law of the specifically human concerns that distinguish man from other living beings. Personal culture is more than mere familiarity with the present state of science, technology, and civil affairs, it is more than acquaintance with books and paintings and the experience of travel and visits to museums. It is the assimilation of the ideas that roused mankind from the inert routine of a merely animal existence to a life of reasoning and speculating. I read this little sentence again because it's so, so beautiful. It's a real Mises sentence, right? It is more than acquaintance Oh, it, uh, blah, 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 blah. it is the assimilation of ideas that roused mankind from the inert routine of a merely animal existence to a life of reasoning and speculating. It is the individual's effort to humanize himself by partaking in the tradition of all the best that earlier generations have bequeathed. And certainly, so this interest then... Uh, ultimately brought him to economics. The reason why he got interested in economics was only, well, because uh, to understand history well, you need to know economics, because economics is the science of cause and effect engendered by scarcity. Right? So in order to understand the working of society well, of past societies, of present societies, and, uh, you need to know economics. So his history of, econo of uh, his interest in history brought him to become an economist, ultimately. I uh, again quote from Mises, from an essay that he wrote in 1959, uh, on the occasion of um, uh, the publication of Eugen von Böhm-Bawerk's Eugen von Böhm uh, Capital and Interest, so the major book of, uh, of Mises' later teacher, Eugen von böhm in 1959. Uh, in our age, the conflict between Economic freedom as represented in the market economy and totalitarian, totalitarian government omnipotence as realized by socialism is the paramount matter. All political controversies refer to these economic problems. Only the study of economics can tell a man what all these conflicts mean. Nothing can be known about such matters as inflation, economic crises, unemployment, unionism, protectionism, taxation, economic controls, and all similar issues that does not involve and presuppose economic analysis. A man who talks about these problems without having acquainted 
himself with the fundamental ideas of economic theory is simply a babbler. The parrot like repeats what he has picked up incidentally from other fellows who are not better informed than he himself. A citizen who casts this ballot without having to, be, to the best of his abilities studied as much economics as he can fails in his civic duties. Okay, so that's something that he picks up uh, uh, at, the, at the gymnasium. Um, uh, so we remember the, these two elements, uh, so humanistic education, very, very heavily concentrated on uh, Latin and Greek and on reading uh, the ancient uh, authors. I have a list of those authors here. Because uh, fortunately, so they're, they're still uh, listed in the records of the, of the gymnasium, right? So uh, for every year, what kind of authors were being read in that year. So Mises read in the original, okay, Nepos, Militares, Themistocles, Aristides, Epaminondas, never heard that name, Pelipo, <laughs> Pelopidas, Caesar, Caesar was, by the way, the the, uh, the only author so far that I read uh, when when I was in high school. Well, about hundred years later, no, not not quite, but uh, and uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an expression of the decline in the teaching of of Latin and Greek because, well, so I have so one author out of whatever six or seven that, that Mises read: Livy, Ovid, Sallust, Jugurtha, Cicero, Virgil, Tacitus. Xenophon, Homer, Herodotus, Domesthenes, Plato, and Sophocles. Okay, it's not a bad list. So that was his background. And uh, once he was done with this, so he joined the university, and according to his, um, in a, uh, um, propensities, well, he chose uh, the study of law. Right? Uh, which was organized at the ta uh, time at the um, uh, 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 Department of Government uh, Studies, or what in German is Staatswissenschaften, the science of the state, the science of government. Uh, he uh, first had, so he joined the university in uh, 1900, in the fall of uh, 1900 and then spend uh, the first two years studying essentially the history of law. This is how uh, things were organized at the time. There were no undergraduate and graduate studies. There was just a separation. First, we study the history of law. And then in the third and fourth year of study, we turn to uh, present legislation, uh, pro uh, procedural law, and so on. And related disciplines, such as economics and history, of course. And it was... Therefore, that he came to, to economics. So in the first two years, he, uh, so he studied the, the history of law uh, and then made a break of one year for his uh, military service, joined the army, and then rejoined the university again in 1903. Um, the way things were set up at the time, so you had lectures on the one hand, but you also had uh, seminars, and uh, things got really interesting only in the seminars because here the students were supposed to write uh, the papers and the best papers would uh, be published. Now Mises was a member in particular of, of, of two seminars that are important for us. One during the first two years of study, he was a member of the Grünberg seminar and in the uh, years of study three and four, he was a member of the Filipovic seminar. Is this? Yeah, well, it's, it's okay. So we have here Eugen from, from Filipovic and Karl Grünberg. Karl Grünberg became later on even more famous because he was the founder uh, of the Institute for uh, Social Research, the Institute für Sozialforschung in Frankfurt. Those of you who know something about 20th century Marxism know that this was the cradle of the Frankfurt School. Okay, so Grünberg... Uh, was the man who uh, 
uh, first was a professor of economics in Vienna, then moved to establish this Marxist school in Frankfurt. And he gave, gave us actually two great Austrian economists. He gave us Mises. And indirectly, he also gave us um, Hans Hoppe. Uh, because Hans Hoppe, when he did his studies in the early 1970s in Frankfurt, well, he also did part of this uh, at the Institute for Sozialforschung. He was, in fact, a pupil of uh, Jürgen Habermas, who was the most famous present-day representative of this school. Okay. And of course, in both, both cases, it was not Grünberg and uh, Jürgen Habermas who taught Austrian economics, right? But in both cases, the turn to Austrian economics came as a reaction against the benefits of these classes. So Mises joins the Grünberg seminar and he quickly sets out to write um, a, a very long paper, in fact, a book length manuscript with the title well, I won't give you the, uh, the German title, The Development of the Relationship, the Relationships Between Lords and Peasants in Galicia, 1772 to 1848. Now, that's interesting because, of course, it's its uh, uh, native area, Galicia. Why does he write about this subject? Well, it was something of a fashion in those days. Karl Grünberg belonged to a, a school of thought that was that we know to do, today as the historical school. Okay, and the, the most famous name that comes to mind when we say the younger historical school is Gustav Schmoller, about whom we will talk later on. But one follower of uh, Gustav Schmoller was Georg Friedrich Knapp. Knapp, we also know, because he is the author of the Staatliche Theorie des Geldes. The state theory of money. We saw the uh, uh, government or the state as the origin, as the creator of money. There can be no money without the state. Okay. But before publishing this book, which he did in the early uh, 1900s, uh, Knapp published other books on peasant liberation. As we say today in the US, or we would say peasant lib. <laughs> So peasant lib was the big fashionable subject uh, among uh, members of the historical school in the 1890s. The movement was launched by the peasant lib study of Knapp himself concerning the eastern provinces of Germany, or let's say of, of Prussia. Why this? Well, remember what we said about the Polish partitions? So Poland, these areas of Poland came to uh, Prussia uh, in the late 18th century. And now the question was, well, what was the overall impact? Was it good or bad one century later? And I knapp. So the, the, the central thesis is, well, there was really peasant lib. Okay. And German rule brought, brought peasant lib because we had, before we had Polish rule and the, uh, and the peasants were not faring very well, right? They were exploited and were slaves and so on. And liberty comes with the Germans. Sounds very weird today, right? In the years after Hitler, right? Bismarck and Hitler. Yeah, so a few years can turn history quite around. So, but in those days, that was not the case. So it was peasant lib, right? And peasant lib comes with Germanization. Now, what Grünberg did was to apply the same procedure to the study of peasant lib in Austria-Hungary. And he covered... These areas, he covered Bohemia, Moravia, there was one third, uh, one that I don't re remember. Well, it was a third one. But in any case, he did not cover Galicia. Comes in Mises, a native of Galicia. Reads Polish, uh, not only Latin and Greek, but also Polish. He reads Polish very well. I don't think that he talk Polish, at least not in later years, but he read Polish. So Mises is the ideal man to set out on a study of this sort, and he does this for Galicia. And he shows that peasant lib was great under the Germans, right? There was peasant lib under the Germans. And actually, well, so it was certainly also oral history because his father, or his grandfather, had been part of this, uh, this movement. So that's very intriguing and interesting uh, for us from the point of view of a Mises biography, because clearly, well, what we see here, Mises starts off 
He starts off his academic career as a, a pupil, as a star pupil, we might say, of the historical school. Okay. It's very interesting in, in several respects, right? First of all, because it shows, well, Mises was not dogmatic. After all, he changed his mind, obviously. Well, he starts off there and he becomes the Austro-Libertarian later. I mean, it's quite a way. Okay. So it's not dogmatic. Uh, uh, and he, uh, uh, it's also interesting because it, uh, it shows, well, so how does he proceed these things? It's not something that he comes, uh, like Athena from the bro of Zeus, right, fully fledged, and he's a libertarian, and rah, down with government, and so on. That's not his point of departure. That's the point where you will finally arrive. He starts off on a completely different level. And, uh, he starts off um, with a goodwill effort, right, uh, in, uh, in applying the methods of the historical school, and then finally works his way away from this. Now, this study was published in 1902 in a prestigious outlet. Uh, the co it corresponds today maybe to uh, uh, Harvard series in government studies. So I don't know whether such a series exists. Uh, but the, the corresponding uh, thing in, in Austria, Hungary at the time. Um, and so brought Mises into, uh, into the limelight of, of the profession as a coming young star of the historical school. Okay, then comes the, the military service, and things get better after this. I don't say it gets better with the military service, but in any case, after the military service, it gets much better. So here we have Mises as a young soldier. He, he's very happy. Probably he's uh, is on his way away from the, from the army. Or probably he's, he's just strolling around on a Sunday afternoon and uh, one of the uh, Central Parks in Vienna and so on is taken here. For what happens then is, okay, so there's one, uh, one bad thing that happens. Mises' father dies. This is a photo of uh, about the time uh, in uh, 1903. And he has a, he has a, a, a gallbladder um, problem that has plagued him for years, and then he didn't survive an operation in the fall of this year. So Mises returns, and he joins the seminar of Filipovich. Filipovich. Who has disappeared. But you saw him before. And uh, Filipovich... Um, the, the, so the, in this seminar, so he contributes uh, several papers on uh, the history of Austrian factory legislation and, and, and other things. So also still from the point of view of the historical school, essentially based on archival studies of uh, administrative records. That was the uh, source material that he used. And based on this material, then he recounted uh, the train of events, how things happened. He was very dissatisfied with this later on. Uh, so that, this is how it goes on the Filipovich seminar. And the Filipovich, uh, those here are interesting, uh, important from um, um, you know, two points of view. Well, on the one hand, then Mises uh, gets here in touch with uh, Filipovich uh, with uh, various other students uh, that would become important for him later in life. For example, uh, uh, Emil Lederer was a famous socialist intellectual. Uh, later on, was uh, a minister in the in the uh, 1910s and 1920s, uh, and um, in the 1930s moved on to the New School of Social Research in New York. was a, was a big time um, uh, left wing intellectual uh, in those years. So Mises met people of his sort in the Filipovich seminar, which was in a way the rallying ground of uh, young intellectuals interested in social policy, which in those uh, years meant um, uh, finding th those areas where the government should intervene to protect the working classes. Okay, That was what social policy meant, sometimes it was also called the social question. But the Filipovich seminar was also interesting, uh, important from another point of view, because it brought Mises in touch with the Austrian school. 
Filipovich himself was a pupil of Karl Mengers, who you know, of course, about whom we'll talk uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, and so he probably also encouraged Mises to read Karl Menger's uh, principles that had been published in 1871, but which apparently had uh, been falling out of use at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. The most important author of theoretical economics in those years was nobody else but Filipovich himself. Filipovich had the equivalent of Paul Samuelson's economics textbook at the time. And so his textbook says, was Grundriss der politischen Ökonomie, Outline of Political Economy. And here you have so the main textbook that would lay out uh, the science not from the point of view of the historical school, but very well from a, from a theoretical point of view, but still explaining the necessity of government interventionism. So Greenberg, uh, Filipovich probably encouraged Mises to, uh, to read Menga. Maybe Mises picked up a volume of Menga on his own because in the fall of this year, another Menga pupil joined the Department of Economics at the University of Vienna, namely Friedrich von Wieser, about whom we will we'll talk later on too. Now, when I say Department of Economics, we've got to be careful. This meant, in fact, two professors. Okay, the Department of Economics consisted of two chairs. And there were maybe, well, three or four adjunct professors uh, that also taught classes, uh, classes. So this was the biggest, the most prestigious uh, economics department in the country uh, in those years. It was just two uh, main professors, two full professors. In any way, so Mises picked up Menga's volume and uh, he later said that this turned him into an economist. Uh, so this was the great revelation for him. He became an economist, reading Menga. Why, uh, why was this? Well, because uh, in Menga he saw um, that economic theory could be realistic. And so he had the best of both worlds. He had theory on the one hand and you had this descriptive character that he only knew from the study of history, always clinging very closely to uh, empirical evidence. And for him, as someone who came from the side of the historical school, that was, uh, of course, a major criterion. If something, someone just pro proposed uh, vacuous abstractions hanging in the air and so on, he would not have been very impressed. But what Menga did was to painstakingly analyze uh, phenomena that were accessible uh, to um, uh, to everybody. Every, everybody could verify for himself. So Menga turned him into an economist, or we would have to say more precisely, Menga completely remodeled, re, uh, changed Mises's orientation, right? because it was not like, well after the last page of the Principles of Economics by Menga, he turns the last page and then. Whoo, uh, he's Austro-Libertarian. <laughs> it's not this thing, but right, we've got, we've got to uh, put ourselves into the position of this young man who comes from a completely different side, who is himself emotionally an interventionist. He wants the government to, to intervene. He wants to use science to improve uh, society. But he's not very happy with the uh, historical school. And then he reads Menga. He says, oh, wow. He talks about things that are obviously important to understand causal relationships in the social realm, but they cannot be uh, seized by any other discipline. Ob obviously, you need some discipline of this sort, whether you call it economics or whatever else, to talk about this layer of reality. So he starts thinking. And he starts reorienting himself. Of course, it's not quite as slow as it comes out now, but he's, he's a fast man and so on. But uh, right, it takes him a couple of times, and when he publishes his first major Austrian book in 1912, The Theory of Money and Credit, about uh, which we'll talk later on, uh, he, he is still not the Mises of human action. Right? He's still ample room for various government interventions. Right? He, he de uh, ridicules almost uh, those who want to use silver and gold coins and so on. Right? These are ridiculous metal is because we all know that well, money can be so much cheaper uh, when we make it, make it out of paper and these things. Right? 
Uh, he believes uh, that uh, uh, labor unions can at least in the short run improve uh, the real wages uh, of, uh, of all employees and, and things like this. And so he has clearly not yet penetrated, not yet rethought all aspects of what he had been taught before, but he is reoriented now. Right? He questions all of this, now, one point at a time. And then finally, now, uh, um, um, come to an end now to allow you to, uh, a few questions. Uh, he joins uh, what for him is the, the crucial uh, educative experience, namely the seminar that Eugen von böhm barwerk teaches at the University of Vienna from 1905 to 1914. Here we have Eugen in all his splendor. Several four-time minister uh, of finance in uh, the Austrian part of the empire, not the Hungarian part, the Austrian part, right, because there was no common finance minister, uh, and a professor of economics at the University of Innsbruck. Karl Menger had tried several times to bring him to the University of Vienna. Each time it was blocked. And uh, the Ministry of Education said, well, look, we have already one of these theorists, weird theoreticians. We need also a representative of the historical school. And so each time Ben Barak was not hired. But then after his last term as a minister uh, of finance was a rather glorious term, 19 to 1900 to 1904, uh, Ben Barak at that point was the most uh, prestigious economist living in Austria-Hungary, known abroad. His books had been translated into major ling- English, French, and, and other languages. Uh, and so um, yeah. he, there was no... Ample other, were now ample other reasons to uh, provide him with a chair, a new chair, a third chair at the University of Vienna. Okay, that's how the third chair came, in, came into being, before, before there were only two. So then we had Wieser, we had Filipovic, and we had Eugen von böhm barwerk teaching at the University of Vienna from 1904 to 1914, when Böhm-Barwerk dies. And he starts his uh, graduate seminar in the summer semester of 1905 with Mises in the attendance and with, uh, well, uh, the elite of uh, uh, young uh, people interested in uh, theoretical social sciences at the time. So you had um, uh, so you had Mises, you had Schumpeter, uh, you had um, uh, later, uh, so there was a group of Marxists also, uh, this, uh, like uh, later, but also uh, uh, Bukharin, and was fam- uh, later on a famous economist in the Soviet U- uh, Union, and so on. Uh, uh, Richard von Striegel later on, and, and others. was a, an excellent group, very high uh, uh, level of, uh, of proceedings, of, of discussions. And uh, the very first uh, semester, that summer semester of 1905, saw the confrontation between böhm Barwerk and uh, a young uh, p- uh, Marxist pupil, Otto Bauer, about whom we'll talk later on. Otto Bauer was uh, the, the rising star, rising intellectual star in the, the socialist camp, rising star in a, in a school that we call today Austro-Marxism. Uh, there's Austrian economics, but there's also Austro-Marxism, was a particular brand of Marxism. And uh, so they were debating the theory of value, right? Bauer defending or trying to defend the labor theory of value of Karl Marx, and böhm Barwerk arguing against. It was a rather instructive experience. Uh, shortly thereafter, in February 1906, Mises received his doctoral degree, at the time, he didn't have to write a, uh, a thesis. There was no doctoral dissertation. Was just a series of oral exams. And he was examining the history of law and uh, Roman law and canon law. Okay, and of course, Austrian law. And then he started uh, uh, his uh, habilitation thesis under uh, Filipovich. Now, the habilitation is a particularity uh, of uh, Central Europe. You find it in, in the Germanys, uh, Austria, Poland, uh, uh, the Czech Republic, and so on. It's kind of a second PhD, right? because we like doing things again, really nice things. We do them again and again. 
uh, no, whereas the, the, the PhD dissertation is meant to f uh, show your aptitude to economic research or to, to scientific research by focusing on a rather narrow question. In the habilitation, you show that you master an entire field of research. Okay, so that, that is the idea of the habilitation. It shows that you are the peer of present uh, professors in that field, which also implies that you can be hired as a full professor directly after having this degree. And Menga, for example, was hired after receiving his habilitation degree. He became a full professor. Okay. Uh, Mises did not. Others, Schumpeter, for example, did. Schumpeter was hired as a full professor directly after receiving uh, this degree. And it's still the case today. Uh, so, of course, it's, it's difficult, but it is possible. So that is the idea of the habilitation. And this habilitation dealt with a subject matter neglected so far by the uh, Austrian economists, namely money and uh, banking. Right? And so that's our subject for this afternoon. I propose that I stop now. It took much longer than, than planned, but also I, I covered a lot of ground. Uh, you can ask questions now if you have, if we don't have enough time or you have more questions after thinking about it, you can bring them up this afternoon too. Okay. Does the historical court, the historical school include Friedrich List? Is he part of that or not? No, he's not uh, uh, usually counted within the historical school because List also makes a theoretical argument. Right, he makes a theoretical argument for protectionism. So List, for those, uh, those are the, uh, the German economist Friedrich List, who publishes a system of national economy in 1840, in which he tries to refute Adam Smith. Right. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, did von Mises himself have any experience with Adam Smith? I mean, I'm sure he did, but I mean, is there any evidence of that being like Yes, yeah. For, for example, there was a, a post-war edition of uh, The Wealth of Nations for which he wrote the preface. And he highly praised him. And in fact, if, if you read a couple of the essays that he wrote um, uh, after publishing Human Action, he always uh, stressed Smithian theme, themes. Capital accumulation, right? And the, 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 so the advancement of, of real wages and so on only comes to capital ac accumulation. Uh, something that he had not done in earlier works. It's, um, uh, Interesting, yeah. I don't have a good explanation for this. In the period you just spoke about, is there any, does Smith have any influence in that period? Uh, nothing that I found any evidence for. I could not exclude this, yeah, but I found no evidence. I suppose that, uh, that, uh, Filipovic, uh, encouraged him to do these readings because Filipovic taught theoretical economics. And so he certainly encouraged his students to read the classical authors. So he must have read at that time uh, Smith, Ricardo, uh, Jean-Baptiste Say. It's very clear that for his um, uh, theory of money and credit, it's, he studied uh, Ricardo in depth. Uh, and of course, Ricardo is much richer when it comes to monetary economics uh, than Smith. So it's not surprising that he didn't quote him much. But but there's no no evidence I've, I've found. Um, how does Mises look back on his work with the historical school? Embarrassed? Uh, yes, well, he, he found uh, that it was fruitless. I mean, there, there were a few things that uh, that struck him when he was still a boy, right? So he was, uh, as I said, so he was interested in, uh, in history very early on, actually even before the gymnasium years, and read uh, historical uh, journals and so on. And uh, he was struck by the bias of the German historians that he found there. He said, well, for me as an Austrian, it was not difficult to, to see this bias that many young Germans maybe did not see because uh, there was the conflict between uh, Prussian-led Germany and, and Austria-Hungary that uh, came to, uh, uh, brought out also in the, in the conflict in the, in the war of 1867. Uh, so he saw this, this, this political bias that was in, but that's of course not yet a decisive uh, consideration to reject an entire approach. But then later on, he also saw the, uh, uh, the substantive limitations I can I can give you a good quote, which he. Da, 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 yeah. Which he talks about this. Da, 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 da. 
Well, I, I think I don't have it under hand. I'll find it later. In essence, what he says is that the historical school got things right in one respect, namely that they understood that uh, in order to make any decision, you had to understand the, the picture, right? so the historical, concrete details of the situation. So they were right about this. But then it's the question, how do you react to the given situation? And here you need to understand something about causes and effect. It's not enough that you just understand what the, what the present situation is. And here then the historical school offered nothing because they, according to them, to their own uh, doctrine, which is, by the way, a th historical doctrine, it's a theoretical doctrine, it's not, uh, it's not uh, history, uh, you could no, not derive any general lessons from history. But then, of course, you have a riddle. Right? If each situation is unique and you have to react uniquely, so then what do you do? Right? And then Gustav Schmoller said, well, uh, we, we've got to change reality to make it uh, um, conform to the prevailing ethical and moral ideals. Okay? By legislation. He didn't care for causal laws. He didn't care for the question, is it possible by doing this, uh, creating law A to attain our end B, for example, increasing wage rates. He didn't care for this. He just well, we need to act according to the feelings of our age. Yeah. And Mises didn't find this satisfactory, which we understand because we, <laughs> we stand on his shoulders. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. See you later.